Awesome. So let's let's get started. Um, Alex, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Well, just thanking you again, Emily, for another session today. This is part of the series uh, of masterclasses, of three masterclasses that HubSpot for Startups and Bridge for Billions prepared for you guys. Uh, if you're part of the community with Bridge for Billions, um, we will share the recording after and probably the presentation, I believe. Emily will just let us know in a bit. Uh, so you can recap and see anything that you would like to explore a bit further. Uh, on our side, we are very happy to share with you the information about our partnerships for HubSpot for startups as well. So you can access your amazing uh, services for startups under privileged conditions because you're an alumni from Bridge for Billions. And I do invite you all to be very participative and do share your questions. You're here with super experts on all these topics. HubSpot has an amazing uh, library, blog, content around all of these tricks and hacks. So do uh, take the chance to, to ask everything you want to know about it with Emily. And just I hope the session is useful and I'm here to support in anything you need during the session online. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. So welcome again, everyone. Um, if you attended the last session, you might have recognized me from the last session. So really glad to be joining all of you again today. Today's session, um, again, is presented by HubSpot for Startups. So there's a couple of things that we provide, and I'm also going to go into some more details about that by the end of the session. But for those of you, um, any newcomers, um, you know, joining us new this time, who may not be familiar with HubSpot for Startups, uh, we partner very closely with accelerators, incubators, and VCs around the world to accelerate growth for their startups. So some of the things that we provide as part of our partnership with Bridge for Billions is that we provide educational resources and exclusive webinars such as this. We love startups and entrepreneurs. So in addition to our startup program, we also have a 30 million venture fund that aligns uh, with startups, uh, that, that for startups that align with our mission to grow our ecosystem better. So check it out and uh, feel free to connect with me if you have any questions. A quick intro of myself, I'm currently leading partnerships for uh, the HubSpot for Startups program based in New York and uh, helping startups through mentorship. In my role, I build comprehensive resources um, uh, such as this and uh, events and founder year-round founder engagement that are designed to help um, founders at earliest stages of their journey. So jumping into our agenda today, we got a lot to cover. Um, growth marketing and growth hacking are uh, two inter are two controversial terms that can be used interchangeably. Uh, personally, I like to go with growth marketing, but you will actually see a lot of similarities between the two strategies as we move along. Firstly, I'm going to introduce you to a topic called growth marketing and a framework we call the AAARRR. Then we'll dive deep into analytics um, and examples. Today's session is mostly going to be about um, screenshots and examples of how we view opportunities for improvement from a marketing perspective based on our learnings from HubSpot's marketing and growth teams over the years. Lastly, we'll go deep into analytics. Um, how do we leverage and use analytics to execute on these growth marketing concepts? Hopefully that will give you some actionable takeaways on some of the things you can experiment with as you're optimizing your own marketing for growth um, as a startup. Without further ado, let's um, dive into it. So pop this into the chat for me. What's your own definition of growth marketing? What do you think growth marketing is um, or growth hacking? Uh, have you heard of it or is it something that's brand new to you? I would love to hear from you guys. Ali said not the hacking. So uh, something I, I mentioned just a moment ago, growth hacking, growth marketing are two terms that can be used interchangeably. Um, you will see that a lot of the strategies, um, I mean, uh, th there will be a lot of similarities between the two terms, but they're essentially based on the same framework. All right, something new, accelerated growth. Um, 
something new, great, small budget, big impact. I like, I like that. Um, yes. Yeah, this is great. Um, so by definition, growth marketing is the process of designing and conducting experiments to optimize and improve the results of a target um, area. So by, by results, I mean how your marketing strategies and the ways you interact with your customers can result in more revenue for your uh, company. If you have a certain metric you want to increase, growth marketing is a method you can utilize to achieve that. It's as simple as that. Now keep in mind that um, growth marketing is not a crutch for a bad product. We know that nowadays you need to make sure you create a product that people um, that people actually want. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, companies with a lot of cash could create a mediocre product and compensate heavily with marketing, but that's not possible nowadays. Um, before you even start thinking about doing growth marketing or growth hacking, if you will, make sure you have a product that people actually want. That's table stakes. You're not going to win in the long game by just having a great product, but you also need to know how to sell. It's an integrated approach to grow your business, leveraging all of the marketing channels at your disposal. So when you think about um, uh, growth marketing, the first thing you should be thinking about is how is growth marketing different from just regular marketing? Um, sorry, that was not this. That was not the right slide. Uh, so the way I see it, and you will also see in a few slides, is that traditional marketing really focuses on the first two letters of this acronym, awareness and acquisition. Generating traffic to your website or social platforms and using that traffic to generate and convert more demand for the team. But, but growth marketing does beyond just that. Once you acquire that traffic and generated those leads, you then make sure that you drive them all the way down to be generating revenue themselves and becoming the most important lever for your business. Your customer referrals should be your main lever for growth as you scale your customer um, acquisition. So in that sense, growth marketing take, takes care of um, the entire funnel of AAARRR. So growth market, growth market, Growth marketers are responsible for determining areas to test and, Im and improve upon. They have the scientific methods and mentality to really develop and design uh, experiments to optimize the identified processes. They conduct experiments to test hypothesize improvements, then analyze the results and do more experiments as needed. So if you're a founder and you're looking to do growth marketing, try to put on that growth hacker hat. Um, and experiment, experiment as much as possible. If you compare a growth marketer with a regular marketer, marketers generally feel that they also have to consider budgets, expenses, conversions, etc. Whereas growth marketers don't really care about these things. So you need to look for someone who, whose true north is growth, um, who's really obsessed with growth. How can we accelerate growth and revenue for the company? They don't consider as much as marketers do about budgets, expenses, and conversions. And the main driver for them is growth. So as a startup, your main driver should be growth. So where do you start? What's the framework to execute on growth marketing? Uh, over 10 years ago, Dave McClure, venture capitalist, angel investor, and a founder of um, one of the top accelerators and VCs, 500 startups, introduced the world to this five-step framework called the pirate metrics. Um, if you ask any experienced startup uh, marketer or growth hacker, they will tell you that this is one of the most important metric frameworks to live by for your startup. Why did he create this framework? It's an easy way for you to measure your startup's growth using these simple key metrics. One thing that all entrepreneurs or humans have in common is that we're all running out of time, right? It doesn't matter if you're a solopreneur, a team of five, uh, a team of 10, or the CMO of a giant company. You only have 24 hours a day, which means all of your actions have an opportunity cost. So how do you determine where you should be focusing on optimizing? 
So AARR is widely accepted as the most important metrics for a startup to focus on. And that's because these metrics effectively measure your startup's growth while at the same time being simple and actionable. It stands for awareness, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue. It's pretty much the bee's knees when it comes to understanding your customers, their journey, and optimizing your funnel, as well as setting some actionable metric goals for your startup. It's also a way of categorizing different metrics and KPIs. Depending on your industry or vertical, uh, you will be paying attention to different types of uh, these pirate metrics. Um, and that the shape of your funnel will look slightly different, but the basic pirate metrics framework should still apply. Let's see how this looks like. How do you make your pirate metrics um, actionable? Um, what I'm gonna show you is actually a combination of experiments and data you might want to look at as you're thinking about these opportunities for improvement and optimizing your marketing channels. Don't worry about taking notes, um, today's session is recorded and the slides will be shared with you afterwards. Just pay close attention and keep your chat open. You're in for a great ride. So without further ado, let's begin. Awareness. Um, awareness is focused on introducing yourself to your potential customers and trying to drive them to take action. How do we make sure uh, people know we exist, right? Some people might call this aspect of your marketing brand building it would be impossible to measure, but anytime a person sees someone wearing a t-shirt with your brand on it, a logo sticker on your laptop, that would be awareness. So you, as you can imagine, consumer packaged goods companies like Tide and PNG, they spend and invest a lot of time in the awareness category. Um, for most of the startups, we start with online marketing, and this is fundamental in today's digital age. More importantly, how do we optimize for that? The two fundamental questions you want to be asking yourself are what channel is driving the most traffic and what channel is driving the most valuable traffic in, uh, that performs best in terms of uh, customer conversion. So we need to measure where our traffic is coming from and how much traffic we have. You'd be surprised, but when I ask startups about their monthly traffic, sometimes they have no clue or don't really know what it is. A lot of people would still know, but have no idea where that traffic is coming from. Uh, not only that, they sometimes don't know how to improve that tr their traffic. Notice that I said um, improving traffic, not increasing traffic, because there are many easy ways to increase traffic. You can easily hack your way to increasing and doubling your traffic um, for your website, but that doesn't mean that's going to result in more revenue for you you need to make sure you're improving traffic. And what I mean by that is you're bringing more qualified leads and potential customers to your website, as opposed to just increasing site visits. It's not only just increasing the amount of people who come in, but also increasing the quality of the people who come in. Uh, by quality, I mean your buyer persona or target audience, the right people you wanna sell to. Uh, remember, driving awareness for awareness sake is not your objective. Your objective is to drive brand awareness for the right people. So you need to know, first, you need to know where your traffic is coming from. Then you need to get a sense of how your traffic behaves based on the data you have. If they come to your website and bounce immediately, that's probably not a good source of traffic or the way you're bringing them in is not right. Um, they're coming in with false expectations. And you can see in this table, those 18 visits um, you got this month from pay search, they were led to somewhere they weren't supposed to be uh, getting to because most of them passed almost immediately. So as you start thinking about these um, experiments, you might, you might think that um, like, what are we doing with pay search where most, almost everyone who comes in becomes a lead for a company. So it seems like the conversion rate there is great um, and we're bringing the right people from paid social, but we're not getting the same, same results uh, from pay search. So what can we improve there? If we look at direct traffic, uh, we're bringing in a ton of people, but the session to contact rate is only 0.37%. So are we bringing the right type of traffic or are we doing enough to get their information? Again, you should look at data like this and start making assumptions and experiments on improving your traffic. 
you should go as granular as you can. If you think of traffic and sources as a generic metric, then you can dig deeper at the page level. So for instance, you can see for this specific page, um, the amount of traffic is coming from each channel and if people are bouncing or not bouncing. Um, for this Wistia video in the bottom, the bounce rate is much lower. So there must be something done right, apparently. What can we learn from this to implement changes on other web pages that have a much higher bounce rate? Now, a lot has been said about bringing traffic organically, but what about paid traffic? Um, like what can we improve when we're investing our dollars in bringing more traffic to our website with pay ads, um, be it Facebook ads, AdWords, or something else? There are many factors you should and can consider. A lot of people like to look at impressions, but what about the, the average size of your deals, the conversion rate? When you invest in paid ads, for instance, uh, Facebook versus Instagram, are you having a higher conversion rate on one or the other? Do these conversion rates change with time or seasonality? All of these factors are variables that are worth doing an experiment to test and measure the effectiveness in driving awareness. So some question in here. Okay, <laughs> uh, I thought that was a question. So great, you got traffic to your websites, now what? So the next letter in the acronym is A, which stands for acquisition. This describes how people eventually turn into customers now that they found you. We talked about looking at site visitors um, and traffic. Now let's look at how many and how those site visitors convert to customers. And I would love for you to take a look at the acquisition part and look at it holistically, not just where your customers come from, but take it into account every step that your customer takes, um, which we will call micro conversions until they purchase your product. So every micro conversion counts. Um, every micro conversion along the customer buying journey counts. Let's take the dating analogy, for example, the first time you said, I love you to your you know, future better half um, also counts too, not just the day you get married. So let's look at an example of customer journey for um, a sales business like HubSpot. Um, so someone lands on one of our pages and then uh, they, they go to, they click on the CTA, short for cover act, call to action. Then they're led to the landing page where they're required to fill out a form um, in order to download maybe an ebook, an exclusive offer, right? So then we collect their information through that form. So they become a lead in our uh, CRM. Or you go to a website, you sign up for the monthly newsletter. And then they have a webinar coming up um, about, you know, their, their, one of their products. You attend the product and after you attend the, the webinar um, and then you have a consultation call with one of their specialists um, after the webinar. So then you eventually decide to uh, make the purchase to convert. Um, so then that's also a, uh, a different conversion path. But we're also going to quickly talk about this new way of converting, which is through chatbots. Uh, what we've seen recently is that great companies are really leveraging chatbots and something called conversional marketing. I'm not sure if this is something you guys have heard of before. Um, conversional marketing to improve the conversion rate. All these steps along the conversion path count as micro conversion and should be measured to A, understand your customer's journey and B, optimize your customer's journey. So if you're a SaaS business or, or just a business that relies heavily on an active sales team, it's also important to distinguish between a lead and a qualified lead. A lead is any visitor to your site whose contact information you've captured in some way, be it email address or phone number. Remember, just because someone signs up for your emails doesn't mean they're really going to, they're looking to purchase anything from you right now. Maybe you offer a free ebook um, or access to some exclusive content they want and that's why they sign up. Maybe they just want to stay in the loop because they're interested in your product, but the timing isn't quite right yet. However, if someone completes the next micro conversion in your customer journey, uh, take 
conversion path number two, if someone completes the next uh, micro conversion, which is in this case, the webinar, um, you know, by watching a webinar on how to use your product or how your product solves a specific problem, you can now consider them a qualified lead as they're actively engaged in evaluating your product, right? So that's when the sales team should come in as the lead now is hot. Um, you might ask which conversion path makes sense for me. Like when do I know if I should take conversion path A, B versus chatbot? It depends on your buyer persona and your customer journey. The answer is you have to experiment. For example, for HubSpot, if someone is on our product page, they're most likely towards the end of their buying journey. Um, so we're probably going to show them a chat. What we've noticed is that if we put our chat on those um, specific pages, uh, our conversion rates are actually higher. Not only that, if we use bots instead of live chats, our conversion rate with bots are doubled that of live chats. Now that's very specific to HubSpot's use cases and our target customers, but you should have a mentality of, you know, measuring every aspect of your marketing to see whether it has an effect on your customer conversion. These are the, the types of experiments you should be running as a growth marketer. An example of that is called action or short for CTA again. When people land on your website, give them something to do. Do you have a clear and central CTA? I'm actually surprised by the amount of landing pages out there without a CTA. An example of HubSpot, you can see there are literally six um, different CTAs for a visitor landing on one of our pages. This is for when we launched one of our uh, newest products, the content management system two months ago. You can see like there are different CTAs, learn more, watch the video, um, go to my account, um, get HubSpot free, um, and, and the chatbots. And so there are very clear CTAs um, on the landing page, on the page that um, your customers know what they wanna do with them. Great, so you got CTAs, right? Now what? Start measuring what people are doing with your CTAs. Which of the CTAs are performing better than the others? Um, in this example, you measure all your CTAs and see how they're performing. What you can see here is, uh, for instance, first one up top by Apple Skook has the highest click rate, but we only have, have it in eight locations, whereas the customer view report CTA down in the bottom is in 3,761 locations, but has only a third of click rate percentage compared to by Apple Skook uh, CTA. Does that mean I need to change my CTA or have the buy Apple Skook CTA in more locations on my website? So as you keep digging your data, if you take buy Apple Skook by 2.87% click rate, could that even be better? Um, you know, what if I personalized it even more, am I able to achieve better results? So if I connected my, you know, CTA with my CRM or um, database, I could identify a site visitor as a customer versus a lead. If a site visitor is a customer, they will see a different CTA that says learn more as opposed to view my reports, which is designed for, um, sorry, learn more, which is designed for uh, a lead as opposed to view my reports, uh, which is designed for customers. So having the centralized, uh, having the personalized CTAs could also improve the effectiveness and yield better conversion rates. Not only comparing CTAs to CTAs, but can I also improve and do better on the existing CTAs I already have. So these are experimental ideas for you to test out and optimize for conversion. Another thing you can consider um, is changing the looks. Even if I change the colors, would that have an effect? Now, a lot of people might think no, especially um, the engineering ones. Color actually does affect click rate, uh, click through ratio on certain CTAs, depending on your type of customer. So changing the look and feel of your CTAs can also impact that click through ratio. Landing page. If inbound marketing is part of your um, digital strategy, you probably have a landing page set up that looks like this, right? 
This is where site visitors are led to after clicking on one of your CTAs. It has a description of what, you're, what they're going to get and the form on the right hand side for you to collect information um, when they click that CTA. Now, HubSpot's conversion team actually ran an experiment two years ago where they tested with different looks, fields, and flows for this landing page. We actually came up with a new way of doing this and revamped our landing page. It has significantly increased our conversion rate and the effectiveness of our conversion path. So five years ago, it looked like this, but today it looks like this very different, right? Very neat and more aesthetically pleasing. It's got a very neat CTA in the middle. So if you want to keep reading, there's more information, right? If you want to fill out a form, it no longer sits somewhere on the page, uh, but it's actually a pop-up. It blurs everything out and allows the site visitor to focus on filling out the form. So if we're giving you a ton of value in, in return, we'll ask the site visitor more questions in that form. Um, some of the things we had experimented with as well, such as how much information should we ask the site visitor in exchange for what we're offering to them. Maybe it can ask you just one question for your email. Maybe it can ask you a bunch of questions if it's giving you a complete assessment on your website performance. Those types of things can allow you to ask more questions and there are more contextual information about your prospects and your website traffic. But try experimenting with form lengths and the appearance of your forms. This is a result of dozens, if not hundreds of experiments we've run until we landed on this flow. And as you assess each specific element, you can look into your forms which forms perform better in terms of customer conversion, which forms have the highest conversion rate. So you can have a pretty high level analysis. If I look at my forms here, I might be converting 19.8% of my traffic. That's actually pretty good. But what if I went even deeper? What if I looked at every single form I have and how it's converting? I can see something like this default form um, is only converting 6.99%, whereas the ebook form is converting 59.82%. That tells me that maybe I should be using that ebook form more. There is certainly an opportunity for improvement there. Also, am I using the right form on the right page? This form in particular, I'm looking at how it performs in different pages. And I can see that if I place this form in either Big Data um, 10 or Big Data 16, one of these uh, URLs, they convert pretty well. But if I place that same form in the second URL, Trends and Job Recruiting, it doesn't perform at all. So maybe I should replace that form in that particular page. That is the importance and value of assessing every marketing asset or channel that you have as an opportunity for improvement. The source affects um, conversion. It can sometimes. Um, whereas the drop, you can, you know, again, dig deeper into the analytics and look where the drop comes from. Is it the form or the uh, or the placement? So Hotjar is also a great tool, and there are also several other heat map software out there that can help you understand how people interact with your channels. So there isn't a single method for testing each channel because every business is different. Um, we've covered, we've just covered ideas and tactics for thinking about these experiments, as well as um, ideas for testing each channel. Keep in mind that when testing, you're not trying to get a ton of uh, traction with a channel just yet. You're simply just trying to determine if it's a channel that could potentially move the needle for your startup. Your main consideration at this point is speed to get data and prove uh, and to prove your assumptions. So for every business at different stage of growth, one singular channel will be the main traffic driver. So find that channel that works for you and then tweak every part of it until you see growth. If no channel seems to be working after testing, the whole process should still be repeated. 
good news is that you now have data from all the experiments you just did, um, which will inform you as to what type of things are and are not resonating with customers. Look at the messaging you're, you've been using, dig deeper to see at what point each one of these channels failed to deliver um, or convert. If you go through the process several times and no channel still seems to be working, then it's probably your product. It may need a little more tweaking. So the last thing I want to leave you with on the acquisition part is that a lot of businesses make the same, uh, make the mistake to spray and pray, try and use every single marketing channel simultaneously to get the best traction. In the words of billionaire PayPal founder and Facebook investor Peter Thiel, it is very unlikely, it, it is very likely that one channel is optimal. Most businesses um, actually get zero distribution channels to work. Poor distribution, not product, is the number one cause of failure. If you can get even a single distribution channel to work, you have great business. If you try for several, but don't nail one, you're finished. So it's worth thinking really hard about finding that uh, single best distribution channel. So, okay, you create a lead, good for you now, they will buy, right? It doesn't happen that way. How many times have you tried a free trial before uh, actually purchasing a product or committing to subscribe? So many times, right? So for SaaS companies, we're most familiar with a limited, um, with a, a limited time trial, like 14 day free trial or a freemium offering. So for an e-commerce company, this could be a loss leader product. And for say a photographer, this could be a free consultation or product samples. So metric two is all about activation. What does activation mean? So activation is all about the first experience your customer has with your product. It's the process where your users try your product. It's not enough to just get people download your app or sign up if they're going to stop using the app right after. Uh, that's why it's crucial to get your user to realize the real value in your product as quickly as possible, hopefully during the activation stage. Activation is something uh, sometimes can have the, have the name of nurturing as well. And we do this a lot at HubSpot with email marketing. So when we look at email marketing, we think of ways to optimize growth. For instance, I've, I've sent um, 4,445 emails with, uh, this month. The delivery rate was 99.53% and the open, rate, the open rate was 3.25%. That's very high level and not specific enough. So you can look at each specific email campaign and see how each of them performs. Which, which ones have the higher open rate, which ones have the higher click rate, uh, which ones have the higher open and click rate. Those are the ones dotted in green in this chart. What have I done differently to those campaigns? As opposed to the ones um, dotted in red and yellow, what, I, what can I learn from this? Could it be the subject? Could it be the way I place my CTA in my email? Keep digging further. You can look at the CTA in your marketing email. What's the click rate there? Um, go deep into how your emails are performing as a way of optimizing um, for uh, activation. Now, if you have a free email model, you want to look at the moment people start using your platform. You could think of the moment they sign up for your trial as the moment of acquisition. Every effort after that should be geared towards successfully activating your customer. For HubSpot, we know that to get someone from a free user to a paid user, we need to get them really excited about using our free tools first. We define things that allow use, uh, free users see the true value of HubSpot in the free version and eventually get them excited about the paid tools or features the platform has to offer. So we have CTAs. Um, within the app that guide users um, through these early stage leading actions, which are indicators of them uh, converting to paid users. So here you can see that uh, we invite, so if once you start using a free version, it gives you the, the option to invite the rest of your team to use it with you. 
some of the leading actions, such as like creating a deal, um, creating sales templates, creating a sales pipeline, can be indications of a free user converting very soon, probably in the next 90 days. Uh, we incentivize those actions within the platform. And that's what I mean by growth hacking activation. The differences between acquisition and activation can be sometimes confusing. So it's important to remember you're solving uh, a customer's problem with content during the acquisition stage, but you're solving your problem with a sample of your product or service during activation. Uh, so for instance, Facebook realized early in their growth that the value for a user occurred when they acquired seven, seven friends in 10 days, which is why they synced your email account to uh, with Facebook to suggest friends. Twitter realized that once you follow 30 people, you were more likely to come back to, um, so they, to, to come back so they suggest popular accounts when you sign up. Dropbox saw that users who uploaded you know, at least one file were much more likely to use Dropbox again. So you guessed that they encourage you to upload a file uh, during sign up as well. Again, you wanna keep experimenting until you find your magic uh, metric like Twitter, Dropbox and Facebook did and build your activation process around it. So the next metric is retention. Um, and it's the most important metric I wanna highlight for today's session. Customer retention is the first thing you should be looking at to evaluate not just your company's marketing efforts, but also your entire product success. Retention means uh, people keep coming back to use your products. So for an e-commerce uh, business, that means someone not only buys from you once, but multiple times. For an app, that means users keep coming back and opening, engaging with the app, for SaaS, that means people who are subscribed to your platform keep using it and stay subscribed. So as you're looking to accelerate your revenue growth as an early stage startup, the first A's are going to take most of your attention and budget. The reality is the silent killer of growth is retention, um, especially if you have a subscription-based business or an upsell or cross-sell type of business. Retention is where you get a ton of value from your customers as days go by, as opposed to just from your first transaction, second transaction. What I've noticed is that a lot of startups fail to define what the leading metrics for retention are. Let's take HubSpot, for example. Uh, 10 years ago, when we looked at customers who stayed on for a very long time and those who turned, we started to map out and hypothesize on the things that long-term customers do within their first 60 days after onboarded. One of the things we realized was that they needed to be using five of our apps within um, the first 60 days. If we could get them to do that, they will truly see the value of the tool and stay on for a very long time. And then we started measuring how many of our new users were doing that. We actually do it. Uh, we actually didn't do it quite right at the time, but what you're seeing here, this chart, is what right should look like. You make sure you do all these uh, things before even starting to accelerate customer acquisition. First, define your customer success uh, measurement. So for us, it was you know five apps by 60 days. For Dropbox, it's one file within the first month. The question you should be asking yourself is, what do I want my newly acquired customers to do within their first month? Um, and how many of my customers are doing that? We started measuring that at HubSpot about 10 years ago. If you look at the customer data from January, only 27% of them did five apps by the end of 60 days, but we kept working on it. And by November, about 73% of our customers were using five apps by uh, 60 days. So this was a sign that we had clear product market fit, and now we're ready to scale customer acquisition. So your churn rate will tell you if you have achieved a good product market fit or not. If a lot of people are dropping off your product after they start using it, um, then clearly something might be wrong and with either your products or maybe your marketing uh, messaging. In the words of Bill Gates, uh, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. So you wanna make sure that your customer churn rate is uh, lower than your customer acquisition rate, a lot lower because um, that's the only way to achieve 
to achieve growth, it doesn't matter how much water you pour into a bucket, but the bucket won't get fuller because um, it's leaking water at the bottom. So it's also five to 25 times more um, expensive to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. So it's easier to sell to someone who has purchased from you before and cheaper and easier to cross or upsell again to a customer you've acquired uh, before than to a stranger. So you need to start defining what your customer success measurement um, looks like and start executing on it. Be it in-app, um, leading actions, onboarding supports, um, or customer success team. Make sure your customers are doing all these landing actions that lead to long-term uh, retention. Incentivize them to take these leading actions and ask for feedback as much as you can. Help as much as possible and get customers to do the things that you know will allow them to see the true value in your product or value. Um, get feedback on the way you're helping. Are you helpful or not helpful enough? Get resources to help your customers, such as help buttons, live chats, um, Etc. Making sure you are getting, making sure you're getting your first few customers to see the value in your product quickly is the main way to scale and uh, accelerate growth as a startup. Another easy way is to keep a nice share of mind of your customers by staying in touch with them. Uh, email automation is a great method for this. For example, offer them, you know, products similar to the ones they've purchased before. Um, or remind them to purchase again if it's something replen replenishable via email marketing. So the next one is everyone's favorite, revenue. How can you increase revenue? How can you make more money? If you've optimized according to the first four metrics before, revenue should already be flowing in nicely at this stage. So no matter what you hear, from people, revenue and um, figuring out, you know, a monetization plan for your startup is really important and that's not easy. Even Facebook and Instagram companies um, that started out as a pure social non-monetary platforms are only successful today because of the large advertising business behind them. What you need to understand is which of your assets or channels are generating the most revenue for you. The best way to increase revenue is by increasing your customer lifetime value and decreasing your customer acquisition costs. Your customer lifetime value is the amount of revenue you earn from a customer during their lifetime as a customer of your products. Um, your customer acquisition cost is the amount of money you spend on acquiring your customer. This includes costs for marketing and sales channels like paid search, advertising, um, et cetera, to get your customers to convert. And a good ratio of LCV to CAC for growth is three to one. It doesn't just take one marketing email to get someone to spend $100 on your product. In reality, most of your leads will interact with several of your marketing and sales channels before they buy. Determining how to attribute revenue to each of these channels will get you ahead of your competition. So I encourage you to Google revenue attribution to look further into this. We have some really great resources and blog posts on how to measure revenue attribution and analytics on this topic. Once you find your optimal channel, focus on that and driving down the cost for getting more people to your funnel. The most important thing here is to remember about, uh, to remember about the revenue stage of the pirate metrics framework is that you're not done at this stage. Um, the path from revenue to retention is only one stage away, but a brand new customer has to go through all the A's um, all over again. Last but not least, we all know the absolute best way to drive growth is through word of mouth referral. Why would you spend large sums of money um, on marketing if you, can just, if you can just have people rave about uh, your products to them? Most of the companies that had accelerated growth uh, gained customers through referral. Uh, take Dropbox, for example, they figured that out early and their referral program was one of the main drivers of their growth. They gave users up to 16 gigabytes of free space by inviting their friends to Dropbox. Zoom exploded ever since the outbreak of COVID, not because they inundated their channels with ads, but people started using Zoom 
more often for you know, virtual interactions and meetings, webinars like this with their network. Back in the days, um, uh, Hotmail also essentially built its own referral program uh, without a user even consciously knowing by including get a free Hotmail account um, in every email that was sent from a Hotmail address. So two metrics you want to measure for referrals are the, and again, this is key, fit before growth. Uh, make sure that you found product market fit before starting to accelerate growth. So two metrics you want to measure uh, for referrals are the net promoter score, NPS, an index that measures how willing customers are to recommend your products or services to other people. It allows you to know how satisfied and loyal your customers are to the brand and your business. Defining and, me and measuring who's happy and who isn't are crucial to your business. Uh, identify those who can be potential detractors in your business and make sure you do something about it. So if you have six detractors, um, make sure, I mean, you should also ask your CEO if you're a founder yourself, uh, to make a call to these uh, customers to understand what went, what went wrong um, so we can make it right and they turn into a promoter instead of a detractor of our company. Another metric to pay attention to is the viral coefficient. The viral, for example, a viral coefficient of two would mean that one customer on average refers two new customers to you. Your viral coefficient needs to be larger than one to drive growth. And this graph shows you the exponential user growth uh, you can have depending on your viral coefficient the number of people one customer refers to you. Um, you can see that an incremental increase of K from one to 1.1 already does wonders for your growth and is really the driver behind virality. So obviously we want everything to go up and to the right, but pay close attention to customer happiness as you scale. Uh, if you have a 97% retention month over month, but a 3% churn rate, you would have to uh, grow your company 40% every year. And that's crazy. That's how much of a problem it is when you don't have great retention. So summarizing, the pirate metrics are the simplest and most effective way to look at optimizing your business and measuring growth. Keep in mind that there's no one size fits all. Um, there are different shapes of the pirate metrics based on your vertical or industry and ideal funnel for your business can look different than the others. So use this framework to guide the most efficient use of your time as a startup. Growth should be your North Star. A great product is table stakes. Remember the pirate metrics, AARR, three A's, three R's, and data's key. Try to develop and um, have the scientific method as well as mindset um, when, you, when you do your experiments. Hypothesize, test, and analyze the results. Growth marketing can be as minute as changing a button color to as complex as redoing an onboarding process. So we did it. Um, Again, I'm here to help. If you would like, feel free to head on over to LinkedIn and connect with me. And I hope today's session um, was helpful to you. Just a, 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 quick, a, a quick reminder that if you're under $2 million in funding, which most of you guys are, I assume, um, and not currently a customer, you get up to 90% off our products in your first year, 50% off in your second, 25% ongoing, if your $2 million to Series B, it starts at 50%. And then 25% off for the rest of your life with HubSpot. It's really easy to apply. I am, uh, there's a link down below, hubspot.com slash startups. But all you have to do is just go to um, hubspot.com slash startups. Uh, it takes two minutes. You're under no obligation to purchase, select Bridge for Billions as your partner, and that way you're eligible for the discount and you're eligible for whatever time you redeem it in. Also, as I said, our uh, base level is free. Our CRM is always free, so I would definitely start there. Um, you also have access to 16 other discounts from our partners uh, within the ecosystem, which will also give you an additional 50K in things that you can use if this is part of the tech stack you're you're looking to build, like AWS credits, um, Fityard, uh, Brex. 
um, et cetera. So with that, um, if I may. open up to, uh, I will open up to the audience for any questions. Emily, this is Alex. Thank you. Hey, Alex. That was super. We have a few questions in the chat. Would you like me to go through them or would you like to, to see yourself? Let's see. Yeah, happy to go through them myself. So let's see. Okay, so let me, I guess the first question is bounce rate, right? Uh, we only have a homepage and about us. Would it be worth it for us to work on decreasing our current 80% bounce rate? They can really, they can only go to about us or fill out a demo from a demo form on our homepage. So I'm guessing it's not very important for us now versus conversion ratio with the form. Um, yes, George, you're very spot on uh, with this. You should, um, so, with the pirate metrics, right? Uh, it it again, it looks different for the shape of the the funnel looks very different for every business. And in your specific scenario, I would recommend uh, decreasing your current bounce rate first, because it sounds like you're getting a lot of traffic to your website, but it sounds like site visitors are coming in with false expectations, so they bounce almost immediately. And that's not a good sign. You want to you might want to work on increasing your um, you know, improving your traffic first. Um, you want to bring the right people to your website. Um, you can have a lot of people filling out, uh, you can have a lot of people coming into your website with a really high bounce rate, but they're not the people that you want to target to. They're not the people you want to sell to. So I would obviously start with uh, decreasing your bounce rate first. Second question, if they sign up for a free demo, not for a newsletter, are they already a quality lead or we don't know until we have more information about whether our solution will work for them? So, okay, so I would say, okay, this is a, this is a, so for HubSpot, for instance, um, if someone signs up for, you know, basically raises their hand for a free demo, they already are a qualified lead because they're actively engaging um, with your contents. They're looking to get a taste um, and a sample of your product. But in terms of whether you whether you would know you uh, whether you would know your solution will work for them, well, first of all, bef before you even start thinking about accelerating growth, you should define your buyer persona first. You should understand that very specific pain points you can solve for your buyer persona, for your target audience. The reality is you shouldn't target to everyone or anyone. Um, you know, you should um, target to the right people that you actually want to convert because with those people, if you know you're targeting the right people, you will get a much higher and better conversion rate as opposed to just uh, people coming in for a free demo, but not necessarily converting because they're not the right people. So you have to know um, what your buyer persona is for your business. Um, you have to keep that, um, it, you have to keep that in front of your mind as well as making sure that your team knows that as well. How can I take advantage of the activation stage if we are a startup that specializes in travel? Um, that's a great question and I would probably need a little more information in terms of uh, your specialization. Like what are you specialized in? What kind of products um, um, or are, do you offer travel products? Um, are you an e-commerce business? What type of business are you? Like are you a SaaS business, a subscription-based model type of business or are you an e-commerce uh, business? Uh, to get feedback can be a real pain and customers hate to do it. Yeah, it's, it's true. Customers do hate to do it. But um, one thing that we've noticed and done effectively at HubSpot is that when, you know, we use our, we use an internal tracker to identify those who could be potential promoters. Um, you don't have to send feedback 
forms to uh, or survey forms to every single one of your customers. You can send, you can start with your uh, potential promoters first and then make sure that the CTA in that email is very clear. It's neat and clear. People know what exactly they need to do. Um, you know, you have a, a centralized a green fat button in the middle that just asks them to click. Make sure you take you take the work out for them as much as possible. Um, people hate to do surveys. I hate to do it sometimes too, but make sure you make it as painless and easy as possible for them. Um, and I would definitely start with those who, I would start with those who, um, who can be potential promoters. How do you measure vi virality? Again, uh, going back to the slides, you measure virality using viral coefficients. Um, it can be hard to, to measure vi uh, virality, to be honest, because um, you can use all the data you have, impressions, um, uh, traffic, uh, and all that to make sure that, uh, you know, and just any data at your disposal. So I have to, let me see, I have to hop off guys, um, unfortunately, so I can't stay on to answer all the remaining questions. For anyone who have very specific questions, um, you could also email me afterwards. Happy to answer them uh, if that's okay. And thanks everyone for joining today's session and I hope you found it helpful. Uh, unfortunately, I have to hop off for another meeting and, uh, and the, slide, the slides will be shared with you afterwards. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you everyone for joining the recording and the presentation after. Thank you.